deciding on the right holiday can be difficult, can't it? But if you're looking for somewhere where, you know, you can relax on the beach, enjoy good food, experience local traditions, somewhere that has sun, sea, sand, and all the excitement of a continental resort, then you can forget all these. I think I've got the perfect answer. Jersey may be only nine miles by five, but it offers so much to the holidaymaker. Secluded bays, wide sandy beaches, warm waters, all with a delightfully different atmosphere. If you've already been, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. But if you haven't, then join me as we sample a taste, just a taste, of this rather special island of Jersey. Hello, and a warm welcome to our video presentation, This is Jersey. During the next 50 minutes, we'll introduce you to many of the fascinating aspects of life on this British South Sea Isle. Try to answer some of your questions on the history of the island, from Neolithic man to the five years of German occupation. We'll look at island industry, including one of our famous exports for the past 200 years, the Jersey cow. Today, as a holiday isle, one of our main sources of income is tourism and we'll look at the numerous attractions you can discover whether you travel by coach, bus, hire a car, or prefer a leisurely cycle through our beautiful countryside. The island is surrounded by interesting bays, each with its own character, and you'll be pleasantly surprised how far your money will go in the superb shopping centre. But keep an eye open for our money. The colour of the notes could be confusing. There are also many top quality restaurants and nightclubs, plus numerous other places of special interest to the tourist. So sit back and join us in a colourful, conducted tour of the island of Jersey. Just nine miles by five, Jersey is the largest of the Channel Islands and slopes from north to south, thereby receiving maximum benefit from the sun. Jersey's shores are washed by the waters of the Gulf Stream, allowing for milder winters and warmer summers than those experienced in the rest of Britain. The island is made up of 12 parishes, with the town of St Helier in the south as its capital. Whilst touring round Jersey, you will notice many of our place names are in French. The closest point to France is Goree in the east, which is only 14 miles from the French mainland. Day trips can be arranged to the nearby French ports of Saint-Malo and Carteret, before the Ice Age, Jersey and France were joined. As the ice melted, the English Channel, which used to be an extension of the River Seine, came into being, and so the Channel Islands were formed. Man is known to have inhabited Jersey for 250,000 years. He lived in caves, such as Lacotte in the parish of Saint-Brulard, where many of his artefacts were found. The most impressive remains were left by Mesolithic and Neolithic man between 8,000 and 3,000 BC, and dolmens and meniers have been found all over the island. Ten sixty six, an important date in Channel Island history. At that time, the islands were part of Normandy, so when William conquered England, they swore allegiance to the English crown. When King John lost Normandy in 1204, the islanders were then faced with the choice between the French and English monarchy. Choosing to remain faithful to England, the nearby coast of France became enemy territory. For the next 500 years, the French made numerous attempts to recapture this English outpost.
Fortifications called Martello Towers were built around the coastline. You'll see many remaining today. These towers were constructed at a set distance apart, enabling the area between to be covered by cannon shot in the event of an attack. The last attempt by the French was on the 6th of January 1781, when a large force landed in the southeast at La Roque, under the direction of Baron de Roulecourt. His troops captured the town and forced the Lieutenant Governor, Major Corbett, to sign articles of surrender. Major Francis Pearson then led the English forces into town and defeated the French. Although during the conflict, Pearson was killed. A memorial to Major Pearson and the Battle of Jersey can be found at the entrance to St. Helier's Royal Square, with a plaque on the wall of the Pearson Inn commemorating the spot where he fell. The French never tried again, and soon after, peace between England and France made the island safe from invasion until the German occupation in 1940. As previously mentioned, prehistoric man left many dolmens in Jersey, the most famous of these being La Hougue B. This huge, 40-foot-high Neolithic mound contains one of the better-preserved dolmens in Europe. Modern-day builders can only marvel at the tremendous task faced by prehistoric man. Great slabs of stone had to be transported by pure strength up the hill to the site. The largest of the capstones, which forms the roof, weighs over 25 tonnes, and the passage leading to the great chamber is 33 feet long. From remains found in this chamber, it's possible to place the height of the occupants at only four feet tall. Other items discovered include pottery, beads, stone weapons, implements and oyster shells. On top of the mound, two chapels have been built. Although they share the same roof, the chapels are from different centuries. Notre Dame de la Clarté dates from the 12th century, whilst the Jerusalem Chapel was built about 1520 by Dean Mabon after returning from the Holy Land. La Hougue is open to the public during the summer months, and visitors can spend a few enjoyable hours inspecting the legacy of an earlier age, and also view exhibitions on island geology and archaeology. Alongside the dolmen, you'll find a German command bunker, which housed one of the main communication posts in the island during the occupation. A different beach for every day of your holiday. This is Jersey's proud boast. From wide open expanses of golden sand to small secluded bays, where it's still possible to find peace and quiet. Many of the island's beaches offer excellent refreshment facilities where the visitor can relax and enjoy a bite to eat or a cooling drink. Working our way westward from St. Helier, we start with St. Oban's Bay. This is a safe, sandy beach for children and excellent for sunbathing and relaxing. Golden sands, clear blue seas and good amenities make St. Brillard one of the most popular bays in Jersey. Ideal for surfers, St. Juan's Bay stretches the full length of the west coast. Atlantic rollers pound the shoreline on this unspoilt and romantic part of the island. The north coast is full of small secluded bays. Plémont, Grève de Lec, Bon Nuit, which was a favourite spot for smugglers, plus Bouley Bay and the quaint picturesque hamlet of Roselle. The fishing fleet used Roselle in the early days when oyster catching was at its height. Nowadays it's a sleepy picture postcard bay retaining all the charm and character of a bygone age, a place where time has stood still. Most of Jersey's beaches are safe for swimming, but the tide does come in fast, especially on the east and south coasts, where some of the greatest tidal movements anywhere in the world have been recorded. The small bay of Anport leads us to Goree, 
another excellent beach for children, with small sand dunes and plenty of refreshment kiosks. The old harbour, with the majestic castle above, makes a wonderful backcloth to this bay. Mont Orgueil Castle dates back to the early 13th century, although recent excavations have revealed the remains of Iron Age defences within the grounds. The castle was built as protection against the French and has withstood many attacks in its time. Until 1600, the castle was the centre of administration and government for the island, being the permanent home of the governor and crown officers. Visitors are helped to understand life in the castle by various tableaux which recreate scenes from the past. One shows Philippe d'Auvergne, Duke of Bouillon, receiving a message from one of his spies on his return from France, where the Duke had organised a secret underground intelligence network. This group supplied London with information of the progress of the war between the two countries. A small museum shows numerous weapons and artefacts which were found in the castle, and tours are available complete with recordings to explain each tableau. A climb to the summit is well worth the effort, providing spectacular views of the island's east coast. In 1600, there were plans to demolish the castle, but the new governor, Sir Walter Raleigh, wrote to Queen Elizabeth in praise of the stately fort, saying it would be a pity to cast it down. Even so, Sir Walter moved the governor's house to the new castle, being built by military engineer Paul Ivy in St Oban's Bay, which he named Fort Isabella Bellissima, in honour of Queen Elizabeth I. Elizabeth Castle was built as a defence for the town of St Helier against attacks by the French. Both English forces and the local Jersey militia have been stationed within the walls, and there is an extensive exhibition of militia uniforms, weapons and medals on display. You'll also find silverware used by the militia as trophies for various shooting competitions. Many of the original cannon can be found in the granite and gunpowder display, including a replica of a mortar used during the second siege of the castle from October to December 1651. The display of artillery is brought up to more modern times with the inclusion of a German anti-tank gun from 1940. A recent innovation is the firing of the noonday gun. This custom has been revived during the summer months and is well worth seeing and hearing. At low tide, this castle can be reached by walking along a narrow causeway. When cut off by the water, visitors can board these landing craft and enjoy a short trip across the bay. These craft offer a safe and comfortable way to reach Elizabeth Castle with frequent trips every day. Some 300 yards along the breakwater, lies the Hermitage Rock. It was here that St. Helier lived for 15 years from 540 AD until he was killed by sea raiders. Both castles have been restored to a high standard and are among the finest in Europe open to the public. They are floodlit during the summer evenings and many postcards are sent worldwide showing Mont Orgueil and Elizabeth Castle by night. Jersey has its own totally independent parliament known as the States made up of 12 senators and 29 deputies plus 12 constables, one from each parish. With no party politics, every person who stands for election has to pay his or her own expenses and tries, through open meetings, to persuade the public to vote them into the states. The bailiff, who is appointed by the crown, presides over the royal court and acts as speaker of the states. Each parish has its own form of government, comparable with councils. The island also has two police forces, uniformed and honorary. The honorary officers are elected by the residents of each parish and their powers are limited to their parish boundaries. Before tourists flocked to Jersey, the main industry was agriculture. Even today, 50% of the island is used for agricultural and horticultural purposes, especially small southerly sloping fields known as coaties, which are highly prized by the farmers. The main export is still potatoes. 
Which British housewife has never heard of the famous Jersey Royal? Early potatoes always command the highest prices, and in an endeavour to be the first in the market, the local farmers have come up with some interesting new ideas. Anyone arriving by air from February to April could be forgiven for thinking half the island was underwater, with field upon field covered with polythene sheeting. These sheets give a greenhouse effect to the soil. Therefore, the soil's temperature is higher, the plants grow faster, and the crops arrive earlier. A secondary benefit is protection from the frost. The Jersey cow is famous the world over for its exceptionally high milk and butter yield. No cattle have been imported into the island since 1789. With careful breeding, the Jersey herds have produced one of the most attractive looking animals to be found anywhere. Some farms are now open to the public, and these are well worth a visit. In the afternoon of the 1st of July, 1940, Lieutenant Richard Kern of the Luftwaffe, purely on his own initiative, landed at Jersey Airport. From his reconnaissance plane, he had seen the white flags of surrender being flown all over the island and decided to investigate. The occupation of the Channel Islands had begun. For the next five years, Jersey was to experience many hardships under the rule of the jackboot. German became a compulsory subject in the schools, and the Reichsmark took the place of Sterling. The regulation which caused most problems was an overnight switch to driving on the right-hand side of the road. Many accidents occurred during the first few weeks. Over 1,200 people were deported to camps in Europe. All but 45 returned safely. Many locals also tried to escape by sea, and 56 are known to have been successful. Hitler decided to turn Jersey into an island fortress, with a garrison of more than 11,000 troops. Thousands of tons of concrete were used to build the bunkers, which appeared on every section of the coastline. Many of these remain today as a silent reminder of the occupation. As well as the many bunkers, the Germans left behind numerous other fortifications and relics of those terrible years of occupation. The most evocative reminder is the vast complex of the German underground hospital at Meadowbank, St. Lawrence. Started in the darkest days of 1941 and abandoned only weeks before D-Day, the underground hospital is an amazing construction hewn from solid rock by thousands of forced laborers working in the harshest conditions. Designed to be completely safe from attack, whether by land or from the air, the whole complex, which caused the removal of 50,000 tons of rock, was gas-proof, centrally heated, and fully air-conditioned. Today, this construction, which incorporates wards for 500 patients, a fully functioning operating theater, and doctors and nurses' quarters, has been recreated with chilling realism, and is one of the most comprehensive museums of the occupation in the Channel Islands. In the tunnel complex, visitors can experience for themselves the hardships endured by the forced laborers as they clawed their way deep into the hillside. Europe has been scoured for the artifacts that once made this an outstanding example of its kind. And today, the underground hospital is a monument to the despair of the dark days of conflict and the joy of liberation. On the 8th of May, 1945, hundreds gathered in the Royal Square where loudspeakers had been erected to relay Winston Churchill's speech in the House of Commons. Ceasefire began yesterday to be sounded all along the front and uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. A must for every visitor to the island, the award-winning Jersey Museum 
is a gateway to our history, culture and environment. The story of Jersey, an island and its people, shows how Jersey was created and the way that its people have lived here from the distant past to the present day. The activity of early man is graphically illustrated with this two-story reconstruction of a cliff face where Neanderthal hunters drove mammoth over its edge. Many of the items have never been on public display. Most have fascinating stories attached. The gold talk, for example, a heavy necklace dating from the Bronze Age, was found by a 19th century workman in St. Helier. Weighing some 26 ounces, it was given to the museum after part was kept as a souvenir, later returned by the workman's wife. People of the Sea portrays the role of the sea as a provider of food, a means of transport and defence against outsiders. The island's oldest industry, farming, looks at the cultivation of local crops, in particular the Jersey royal potato, and that most famous of island animals, the Jersey cow, renowned throughout the world for the quality of its milk. Most of the museum displays allow visitors to get closer to exhibits than one would expect. Here, examples of island wildlife are carefully set out. Jersey Museum is very much a hands-on experience, with interactive video screens helping the visitor understand aspects of the island better, even a quiz on Jersey to test your local knowledge. The landscape and life of Jersey has inspired both local and visiting artists since the 18th century. The museum's Barrow Le Maitre Art Gallery has a collection of around 4,000 works, mainly paintings, prints and drawings by local artists, or depicting Jersey subjects. Visitors interested in the traditional ways of island life should take time to visit Jersey's superb country life museum. Hampton is a fine example of a 17th century farmhouse, carefully restored by the Societes Jerseyes and the National Trust for Jersey. The building is of a type known as an upper hall house. This style of architecture was common in medieval Brittany, where animals and stores were kept on the ground floor, with the main living space being upstairs, reached by an outside staircase. Over the centuries, Hampton House has been altered many times to accommodate changing tastes, and today the building is a mix of four centuries of fine architecture. The Jersey Museum service hold regular theme days for visitors. Here you may find many traditional island activities being worked. Its bakehouse offers an insight to the preparation and making of Jersey's unique cabbage loaves, where each loaf is placed on a cabbage leaf and cooked in an oven prepared 24 hours earlier. The loaves acquire a superb flavour, unlike any other type of baking. Cider making was always an important part of Jersey farming life. A working cider press has been reconstructed, allowing the visitor the chance to view the process in action. Step back in time to a traditional way of Jersey life at Hampton Country Life Museum, St. Lawrence. One of the most enjoyable ways of spending a beautiful summer's day is discovering the island's many coastal walks. Although there are walks on all four coasts, the most popular are the cliff paths on the north of the island. Through a local job creation scheme, with the cooperation of landowners and the National Trust, rough paths have been cut out of the heather and gorse. The scenery is magnificent, with clear views of the other Channel Islands and the coast of France. The cliffs, at most points on the north, drop several hundred feet into the sea. The constant cry of gulls and waves breaking over the rocks below are usually the only sounds the walker hears.
If you are quiet and stand still for a few minutes, you may be fortunate enough to see a few of the multitude of rabbits which inhabit the area. Small birds and other forms of wildlife add to the beauty of these walks, whilst wildflowers create a mass of colour at certain times of the year. It's impossible to miss the Jersey Lavender Farm. Just follow your nose. The farm covers six and a half acres and is one of only two such farms in Britain. There's much to see here, and the scent of lavender is an experience all by itself. See the distillery room, where the lavender has its precious oil removed, then follow the various stages of blending until the famous Jersey lavender eau de toilette is bottled and packed, ready for the shops. Every September, the people of Britain remember the men and women of the RAF who lost their lives during the Second World War. Jersey arranges special attractions during Battle of Britain week, climaxing with an air display over St Albans Bay. Thousands line the promenade to watch and remember. They are treated to a marvellous display of low-level flying by many of the original planes from the Second World War. Including the memorial flight by the Lancaster bomber, flanked by a hurricane and spitfire. Hundreds of children, too young to remember the war years, have come for only one reason, the Red Arrows. The symbol of Jersey Zoo is the dodo. Without zoos like ours, a great many more species of wildlife would be lost. The Jersey Wildlife Preservation Trust was formed to help famous naturalists and conservationists Gerald Durrell finance his small private zoo, which he opened in 1959. Tremendous success has been achieved in the breeding of rare and endangered species in captivity. The zoo has a record second to none and it has now embarked upon a program of releasing animals back into their natural environment. Set in the beautiful grounds of Les Grey Manor, the animals are given as much space as possible, and the compounds have been designed to resemble their natural habitats. In 1986, the zoo became world famous when the male silver-backed gorilla, Yambo, stood guard over five-year-old Lee Van Merritt, after the child had fallen into the enclosure. An amateur cameraman was fortunately on the spot and these incredible pictures of Yambo stroking the unconscious boy were shown worldwide. Yambo was also one of the zoo's success stories as far as breeding was concerned, with over 15 living offspring now extending to six countries. Sadly, this silverback is no longer living but his influence remains. Any individual or group can adopt an animal of their choice for a small annual charge. Many local schools have joined the scheme, 
and it's common to see eager-faced youngsters clambering to obtain a better view of their very own animal. A marvellous idea to get the young interested in conservation. The picturesque village of Goree is home to the Jersey pottery. The art of the potter can really be appreciated to the full, since the visitor is granted free access to every stage of production. From the potter's wheel, where a lump of clay is moulded by skilled hands, to the painting room, where artists decorate each item, which, in effect, makes every piece an original. Great pride is taken in the quality of each article produced, and the vast showroom is a testament to the skill and dedication of the potters of Goree. Whether you require a table lamp, coffee mugs, inscribed with the names of your family, or a full dinner service, it's on sale. And remember, everything is handmade and therefore individual. Their award-winning restaurant specializes in all manner of local seafood. Who wouldn't be tempted by the sight of a freshly caught Jersey lobster presented with your enjoyment in mind? Outside, the superb landscape gardens with pools, patios and a profusion of flowers and shrubs offer the summer visitor an ideal chance to relax and enjoy their holiday break. Jersey is rich in craft centres, with perhaps the best known being Latac Woodcrafts in St. Juan. Craftsmen work with blocks of wood until masterpieces are lovingly created. Many unusual souvenirs can be found, including the Birthwood Tree Calendar. It appears we are not only given a zodiac sign, but also born under a certain type of tree. One area not to miss is the magical world of the Lost Forest. As you enter the Latak experience, look for the seven wooden pomegranates, and don't forget to wish on the magic ball. Here, children can explore and learn the secrets of the touchwood tree. I am the spirit of the magic ball. Touch me gently and make a wish. A gift unique to the island is the cabbage walking stick. These were first made in the island as far back as 1870 and come from specially cultivated cabbages called longjacks. They grow up to an amazing 15 feet, and none of the stalk is wasted as the small pieces left over after the walking stick has been produced are turned into shoehorns, corkscrews, key rings, and many other ingenious gifts. If you're looking for true family entertainment and excitement, then the living legend above St. Peter's Valley is the place to visit. This unique village attraction offers over eight acres of entertainment and information for all to enjoy. You're free to take advantage of the live entertainment on show with music and fun mixed in to keep even the most energetic of children entertained. The Jersey shopping village is worth spending time in. Here, interesting and unusual gift ideas, including Jersey products and local craft work are on display. You can even research your family name and discover the heraldic coat of arms associated with your ancestors. Take time out and enjoy a break in the Jersey Kitchen restaurant where hot and cold food is prepared using Jersey fresh produce with traditional island dishes and recipes. The centre of attraction at the living legend must surely be the spectacular three-dimensional audio-visual show your journey passes through the eerie world of local legends and folklore. You'll soon find yourself many leagues beneath the sea, with an opportunity to discover more about Jersey's maritime past. The experience is now ready to begin, as you are invited to enter the mysterious world of Le Manoir de la Brequette and discover the truth behind the living legend. Let us cross the drawbridge of time to discover the stories and legends of these once lonely coasts. This was a time when magic and mystery were fueled by the dark mists and the wild wind-blown spray. Fairy stones. 
dolmens and menus marked the sacred sites of prehistory. Granite stones jutting from farmhouse chimneys were used as witches' resting places as they broomsticked through the night. To visit the living legend, just follow the signs from St. Peter's Valley. Leisure and pleasure are important parts of any holiday, and the island caters for the interests of its holidaymakers in a big way. Dominating St. Helier's skyline is one of Europe's most comprehensive entertainment, sport and conference centres. Built around a Napoleonic fortress, Fort Regent offers major attractions throughout the year. Setting the scene for some of the best entertainment in the island, the Piazza area hosts regular live stage shows. Children are not forgotten with a host of exciting and entertaining attractions. Welcome on board the helicopter line. Today we'll be taking you over the beautiful Broadway Lakes onto the extinct volcano of Mount Tarawina and through the famous Waimundi Valley. So strap yourself in and hold on for the ride of your lifetime. For those with sport in mind, the fort offers a wide range of facilities, many available all year round. Fort Regent offers you a whole world of exciting family entertainment. Although nearly every sport is played in Jersey, there is obviously a great emphasis placed on water-related activities. St. Oban is the centre for water skiing, with equipment and speedboats for hire. Tuition is on hand if any visitor wants to try something totally new and exciting. The bay is ideal for this sport, wide and void of dangerous rocks. The experts make it all look so easy, riding the bow waves left behind by the speedboat. Surf jets are also available for hire. These are great fun and need no special skill or training. For the more adventurous, try the underwater excitement of scuba diving at Bouley Bay. Here, qualified instructors will help you experience this unique sport beneath the waves. With a tremendous view over St. Juan's Bay, we find the island's main golf club, La Moy. The Jersey Open tournament is now part of the circuit for many of the top golfers. And if you are a member of one of the leading clubs in Britain, there is a chance of a game on this superb course. The clubhouse is of a standard which puts Le Moy in the top bracket in Europe. Definitely not a course for the beginner. They're catered for on the smaller ranges. In 1938, one of Jersey's main benefactors, T.B. Davis, gave the states a large area of land just outside St. Helier in memory of his son, Howard, who had been killed in the First World War. Howard Davis Park is now the island's foremost park and welcomes thousands of visitors every year who are in search of peace and tranquility. These beautifully maintained gardens have been superbly landscaped with a small lily pond, numerous walks and a colorful and fragrant rose garden. The park is a mass of colour at any time of the year with interesting displays. Even a working clock installed in one bed with its entire face made out of plants and flowers. Flowers are a perfect gift and a box of local carnations posted direct to the mainland will certainly please all your friends and relations. Located in St. Juan, you will find Sunset Nurseries, producing some of the island's finest blooms.
Many coach tours include a stop at this nursery to give you the opportunity to inspect at first hand one of our main exports. Over one million flowers are grown each year at this nursery alone. You'll soon discover there's more to see than just carnations. An indoor tropical garden has been set up in one greenhouse, complete with trout pools and aviaries. On the subject of flowers, every August, Jersey shows off what has become known as the premier attraction for both tourists and locals, the Battle of Flowers. In true carnival atmosphere, these superbly decorated floats parade around the arena. The largest entered by the island's parishes are between 40 and 45 feet long with over 100,000 blooms on each float. They each depict a different theme and are judged depending on size and type of flowers used. Most are decorated in cultivated blooms, whilst others use wild flowers with a special class for floats covered in paper blooms. Miss Battle of Flowers, chosen from the many beautiful girls on Jersey, leads the parade with the celebrity from the world of show business, acting as her Mr. Battle for the day. The word battle originated at the time when floats were torn apart at the end of the parade and the flowers hurled in all directions. These days, the floats are kept as long as possible for all to enjoy. Most remain in the floodlit arena during the evening to allow the crowds to make a closer inspection of the floral masterpieces. Then it's on to the fair where the carnival atmosphere continues. If you haven't worn yourself out sunbathing or visiting one of our many attractions, your hotel staff will be delighted to tell you about Jersey's exciting night spots, featuring international cabaret stars and favorite artists who return to the island year after year. Whether your taste is for the music of the minstrels, lavish Parisian extravagandas, or first-rate theater productions, you'll find what you want in Jersey's nighttime scene. For those with the energy, there are bars and clubs where you can enjoy the latest sounds into the early hours of the morning. Jersey boasts some of the best restaurants in Europe with food and service to match. Your choice is not limited to English cuisine. We can also boast French, Italian, Chinese and Greek. Local shellfish is a speciality and everyone should try at least one night out at a seafood restaurant where you're guaranteed the best money can buy. Hello. During a vacation, most people end up in at least one of our pubs. These range from the ordinary English pub to the more unusual venue. The windmill in St. Peter used to be an old flour mill whilst Le Moulin de Lec may surprise you. Its main lounge invites the visitor to relax in a traditional Jersey setting. Above the bar, part of the original watermill can still be seen. 
Jersey has award-winning local beers, and many visitors acquire a taste for the strong local pint. <laughs> As we've already seen, Jersey restaurants have a standard which would rate highly anywhere in Europe, if not the world. Unique to the island is the annual Good Food Festival. Any restaurant or establishment serving food to the public may voluntarily enter, and a team of international gourmets pays a surprise visit to sample the fare on offer. For a week in May, the judges circulate, choosing dishes from a la carte and the set menus. Many restaurants have special dishes or even whole gourmet menus which they feature for the week, and thousands of locals and tourists flock to their favorite restaurant to sample the many mouth-watering dishes. The judge's opinion of the catering standard is measured by presenting winning establishments with an award in recognition of their culinary achievements. The arts are most certainly alive and well in Jersey. Drop into the Arts Centre in St Helier and you may be fortunate enough to find one of their many and varied concerts being staged during your stay. The centre includes the Benjamin Mika Theatre, which regularly features local and overseas artists in mime, dance, plays and musicals. The Jersey Arts Centre prides itself on the varied programmes on offer. Enjoy an excellent lunch in the bar. Then visit the Burney Art Gallery upstairs, where local artists and photographers are given the opportunity to exhibit their work. If one of the excellent array of pictures takes your fancy, it's usually for sale. Shopping in Jersey is paradise for the visitor with an eye for a bargain. The shops are free from VAT, and the duty on many goods is less than in the UK. Most people spend a few days of their holiday browsing round the stores, many of which stay open till nine or 10 at night during the summer months. And remember, friendly service and advice is always on hand to help find that exclusive present. Careful selection amongst the long line of jewelry and perfume shops will give you great savings compared with mainland prices. Many stores display both the Jersey and UK price as a guideline. The low tax on alcohol and cigarettes makes prices very attractive. Just be certain to ask what the legal duty-free allowance is when you purchase. One of the beauties of shopping in the heart of St Helier is the paved precinct. This means traffic-free movement between shops, which is a great help when young children are present. Shopping can be hard on the feet, and some cafes have placed tables and seating across part of the precinct close to their premises to enable the weary shopper to have anything from coffee to moule or crepe in true French fashion. Like many towns in Britain, St Helier used to have a weekly market which was held in the Royal Square and where the country folk could bring their fresh produce to sell. Now we have a grand Victorian building which houses the colourful stalls displaying all manner of fruit and vegetables. Early birds can witness the farmers delivering their Jersey fresh crops and the quality and quantity is always of the highest standard. The covered market has a grand central dome, which has protected the stalls and visitors for over 100 years. Below, a colorful fountain invites you to leave a coin and make a wish. We're proud of our Jersey fresh produce. At various times of the year, you'll find special stalls erected where samples of Jersey fresh recipes are distributed to the passers-by. Across the road in Beresford Street is the fish market. Once again, Jersey Fresh is the slogan. Lobsters, crabs, oysters and mussels make tempting buys. Being so near to France, the island has always had strong connections with its closest neighbor. Many Jersey parishes are twinned with French towns. So it should come as no surprise to find a 12-day annual festival featuring all that is best in France. Whole streets are blocked off from traffic and stalls appear on the pavements selling crepe, wine, French bread and delicious pastries. And to finish, why not try a glass of Calvados, the special French apple brandy. Buskers parade amongst the tables which spread across the street and accordionists help to extend that unique Jersey French atmosphere.
Yes, this is Jersey. And I hope you found this brief glimpse an entertaining and interesting guide to the pleasures and treasures of our lovely island. Thanks to William the Conqueror, Jersey is different. And long may it stay that way. She could ride, climb trees. She lived the life of a tomboy. Emily Charlotte Le Breton was also very beautiful. Oscar Wilde said of Lily Langtree, you have risen from Jersey like Venus from the foam. London society of the day had never experienced such a woman. Artists clamored to paint her image. The public flocked to see her wherever she went. Even the future King of England could not escape her. This fascinating insight of her life and times is available now. Lily Langtree, her true story, now on video.